I think climate change has been mentioned a few times, and I think it's actually quite scary, the situation we're now in. 1.1 degree of warming, above 400 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere, so twice pre-industrial levels. And it's been um, shaming and empowering to see people like Greta Thunberg, the Swedish youngster, 15 years old, going to the UN and saying, no, actually, I can't go back to school because there's a future we need to fight for. We've really got 12 years to, to turn this around. And if present rates are anything to go by, we're going to have some pretty scary weather to deal with in the future. In terms of the work I've been involved with, I was formerly a research associate at the University of Liverpool uh, in natural flood management. I was here several years ago and I was kind of a lone wolf in, the, in, in a room of engineers saying NFM's got a part to play and I said there's no evidence. So the Environment Agency thankfully came along with Lydia Burgess Gamble to lead the working with natural processes work. So some of the work I've been involved with there in Blackbrook in St Helens is profiled in that. The Institution of Civil Engineers written to the engineers themselves to publish a paper in partnership with us to put some evidence behind natural flood management. And now we've got the US Army Corps of Engineers have done an engineering with nature atlas for looking at case studies from around the world. And in particular, some of the work I've been involved with is way back in the document at 100, page 186. So as Bede was saying there, I've been uh, twice. I should come a bit more often to support the Slow the Flow works in Hebden Bridge. And I think Therese is in this photo here. And these, some of these photos come courtesy of Amanda. Thank you, Amanda. Um, and my mum up there building leaky dams. So I think it's in terms of climate change and the work that's being done there, it's really important to have a culture within the catchment set of, of, of groundwork activism and demonstrating slowing the flow. I'm a member of a charter, Chartered Institute of Water and Environment Managers. Bede and I last year wrote an article saying it takes a community to slow the flow, a wide partnership of experts, landowners and others to bring about real change. So NFM, what's it all about? I'll try and take Chris's advice and not go into the depths of hydraulic modeling. But um, basically, we've got a hydrograph here. So we've got time versus volume. So in a short time, there's a quick amount of volume coming down the catchment, flashy, too much volume, too quickly. So actually, flooding is about this, this little red dot, the volume that gets out of bank in a catchment. And this comes from Paul Quinn, it's one of his hydrographs. So actually, NFM is all about slowing the flow and reducing the peak volume, the peak level that travels through uh, a community at flood risk. And there's a diagram there. So it's like suds on a catchment basis. Another one from Paul in Belford, You've got the stream running down. Before the intervention, it would just pelted water down the hill, down towards Belford, the community at flood risk in the northeast. But actually, cutting a shallow inlet, creating a bund, you can store that up on the field scale plot. And over the hill in uh, Rochdale, they, uh, this peak flood is lived, basically. So this is this is a Boxing Day 2015 floods, the same floods that affected Hebden Bridge. And there's a lot of water spill out there, and it's not to get lost in the, the data that sits behind the understanding of this, this flooding. It's hydraulic models which exist for many communities that are at flood risk. But just simple analysis of those hydraulic models can give us an indication of how much water is spilled out into the floodplain in Rochdale in a given magnitude event. So within the model, there's a depth grids of water through Rochdale and Littleborough for the one in a hundred year event, up to 3.6 meters of water. But the total volume of water spilled out is 340,000 cubic meters of water. So if you imagine 136 Olympic swimming pools, that is a peak flow volume that's breaching onto the floodplain. So if we can start to hold up some of that water at the right time in the landscape, we can start to alleviate flood risk. So if we break those figures down further, so 340,000 affects 1,000 properties, but for 340 cubic metres, so about a, roughly the size of this room, a little less, probably about half, we could save one property if it attenuates at the right point, and that's quite crucial. So I think it's an at minimum calculation that we need to look at. So the Environment Agency, uh, developing a capital scheme now in Rochdale to, to reduce flood risk. So linear flood defences, flood alleviation storage basin, but they can't hold up an, 
hold, hold up enough water in the landscape to slow the flow. So I've been working with Sarah Parkington at the National Flood Forum and the Environment Agency and others and looking in the wider catchment to see where we could look, slow water, hold it up in the landscape. And so there's different locations here. So this is the M62, and this is the surface water flood map and flood incidents which have affected the highway. So early on, we started to look at actually could we store water right in the headwaters of the catchment. And we recently secured some funding with the council to start to slow the flow. So we started by doing what we could, where we could. And there's a local wildlife site at Hollingworth Lake and a nice straight channel, or not so nice, passing water straight down, no real exchange with the floodplain, nothing to slow it. But there's an old pond adjacent to that channel and there's actually an offtake and an outlet and there's some water coming off the hill slopes. So with the ranges at that site, we decided to put a flow deflector in, push it into a pond for high flows, put a sluice in at the back as well, put a new wetland in, decove at a stream to hold up about 900 cubic metres as an initial demonstrator of slowing the flow on a public park. So we'll begin to revegetate. This is just the start of the work, so it's, there's more run going as we speak. So there'll be more tow going onto those embankments, which, which I'd like to see. And it's important to emphasize, actually, within that catchment, people have been doing this themselves. So Sarah found a, an individual who put his own bund in, and this was taken two weeks ago, in the same event that affected Hebden Bridge. So after we finish the works here, we're going to go up to this site and we're going to bulk out that bund. We're going to make it one in three slopes either side. It's going to run a few, about 40 metres in length. We're going to go up that overland flow pathway, put a sleeping policeman in with a drainage pipe beneath and do some further works. So there's about 40 or 50 measures, give or take, that we need to do in that catchment as part of the means to reduce flood risk. So it's, it's about the hard engineering, but the soft engineering too and working with people to bring about that change. But it's important to understand how many leaky dams do we put in in these catchments? How much attenuation do we need to hold back up in the landscape to reduce risk? So it's roughly quantifiable, but not absolutely exact, because I don't think hydrology is an exact, exact science. And another site we're looking to go to also. So we were actually on the site this week. So we held surgeries with the community and said, who here would like to do some slow the flow? We had landowners come forward, so this is a, a farmer, and this was a, a photo of the runoff down his land a fortnight ago. So we could be led by the model data, which shows us there's a runoff pathway. We've gone out, we've consulted someone, there is a runoff pathway, and now we're going to propose to put some timber buns in that location to slow and hold up the water, similar to what they've done in Picker into these these could have come from the Forestry Commission, where Mike and others have been involved in there. And this is a photo of that flush. But it's important when we're putting wood in channels to make sure what we're doing is structurally resilient and it's actually going to live in the landscape for a long period of time. So this is the photo a fortnight ago of a, uh, of a grabber basically taking loads of wood out the, uh, the channel in, in Rochdale Town Centre itself. So doomsday scenario and it's unlikely but if I was ever in the dock Mr Norbury what have you done to make sure your leaky dams are secure and, uh, and that wood down there isn't, isn't your wood that you've put in those overland flow pathways so what we've been saying is make, make living dams basically so very similar to what's been going on here you've got your horizontal timbers going across the stream and the floodplain and the vertical securing those but behind the actual measure including willow, so back, back weaving the structure, so it's a living barrier in the landscape. And this is what we did at the Bolton estate, so the Smithills estate that the Woodland Trust recently purchased. So it's seven kilometres squared of land to play with to slow the flow. There's 57 properties at risk downstream, so great fun. We had the environment agents out for their corporate days, so anyone who's seen SAS, are you tough enough? This was like NFM, are you tough enough? Horizontal rain water over your ankles etc and this this field here has got i think it's about seven or eight thousand trees going in and on the water course going down we're putting three leaky barriers in so you can see one down here this willow is one month old and it's already coming into life we're starting this dam it's by no means finished but you can see as we build it there'll be a living permanent barrier 
behind that, that feature, basically. So in years to come, if the wood rots away, there's actually something binding everything together. And this is a photo of a dam further downstream as well. The deer, the deer are now excluded, so they can't have a nibble at the willow also. And you can combine multiple layers of protection together. So this is Blackbrook in St. Helens, where we've done about 15 or so measures. And a farmer had just gone and dug a scrape above some properties which were flooding from surface water, but they still flooded from surface water. The Mersey Forest historically planted 50 acres of trees there, but Pilkington's glass took all the sand, so the, the, the actual soil runs off a lot of water. So with the scrape, we put an engineered log jam in, so a living natural feature here, it's been built in summer. And we've got a load of clay, a heck of a lot of clay, and built a big bund around the back of that with drainage pipes through it to pass that water downstream in ordinary conditions, but to hold it up in the landscape. And above that, we built about five or six engineered log jams in the woodland to slow the flow as it comes down. And it's just crazy. This is within three or four months of sediment that's built up behind that barrier, a living natural barrier. As you can see, the one down there, down, downstream is, is, is now growing. So it's great to have different landowners on board. And there's, there is usually people out in these catchments who will just say, yes, I'll do it. Or I've already done it themselves a little bit and just need a little bit more guidance and uh, assistance to complete that work. And also being bold on height with the barriers where you've got a steep slope. If you've got a steep slope and a one meter barrier, you're not gonna hold up much water. You might slow that flow, but if you're on a more gentle gradient, you might hold more water back and that's more water back up in the landscape than is downstream. I appreciate you can only work with what the landscape gives. If you look around the hills here, it's incredibly steep. And this is, uh, one of four engineered log jams we put in a former reservoir bed. So that runs about 40 metres across the floodplain. It's on Triple SI, so Natural England, we're back in that. And we've got the River Restoration Conference coming to this site this year. And so we thought we'd better make it look good, make it look a bit more engineered. So we went out, got soaking wet, and you can see all this willow here. We just basically cut it and dropped it. So it's like dead hedging across the stream. I think Natural England dubbed it hydro hedges, which I think is quite quite a neat term. And elsewhere, we've looked at different measures. So the River Dane flows brown in times of flood. It's very enriched with nutrients, basically. Um, there's lots of farms in that area. We've done some water quality testing there. So we've got ammonia at 10, 10 milligrams per litre. It shouldn't be above one. It's really, really uh, nasty stuff coming off some of these farmyards. And we've got the Environment Agency's operations team involved. So these are the people who usually fish wood out of rivers. We said, actually, how about we put some in, but we'll, we'll secure it nicely. So they bought the big Vultra tractor out with a big winch, some chainsaws, and we had quite a good time. We also bought, brought in Reese Heath Agricultural College. These are the guys who can speak to people about stewardship, about how actually there may be revenue available for these sorts of measures that we're putting in, because it's all very well and good putting something in with capital funding, but what happens in five or six years' time? So there perhaps needs to be a conversation about the new stewardship scheme to, uh, to uh, actually incentivise farmers to deliver, slow the flow. I think at present, a lot of farmers we've spoken to just say, we don't want anything to do with stewardship. It's bureaucratic, it's a nightmare. One, one other site we've dealt with in New Mills, a farmer lives right at the top of the catchment, which is flooding properties. He's done his own ponds up there, and now we're gonna go and plant some trees and do some more leaky dams. Because he'll lose about 0.1 hectare of land, so 1,000 metres squared to trees and water retention measures, that's loss of grazing land. So the Rural Payments Agency will reduce his income by about £30 per year. Now, that's not a lot, but the principle should be that if someone's slowing the flow, they shouldn't be penalised for it, particularly when there's public benefits downstream. And this is just some of the people that we've brought together in the partnerships to slow the flow in these areas across corporate away days with Environment Agency, the Environment Partnership, Co-op, other individuals. Edwina's in the photo here with Environment Agency's ops team, so the farmer is mucking in to do slow the flow on their land, which is great to see. But as we begin to slow the flow with these hydro hedges, there's actually alterations to water incurred so dam two on that diagram the depth grids of water correspond to this map 
So you're seeing the water back up here, ordinarily it'd be going underneath that channel. But as you introduce water to the root zone of plants, you begin to reduce the nutrient concentration. So things like phosphate and nitrate are implicit in eutrophication, the process of water quality decline. And as water flows through the dams, it reduces. So about by 96% phosphate through that, that area. So there's a, a wider conversation to be had, not just about flood risk mitigation, but also European Union Water Framework Directive benefits that can be conferred through these measures, as well as the restoration of priority habitat wet woodland. So that's just a quick whistle-stop tour of some of the sites and the activities I've been involved with in the Northwest. This is a map which my colleague Tom Butlin and I created in partnership with the Environment Agency. It looks at communities at flood risk from the blue dots to the red dot, so between zero and 50 to more than a thousand properties at risk. And we mapped it out through the north as part of the northern forest mapping to see basically where there are small catchments and a community at flood risk downstream where something could be done. So it's just to show there is opportunity out there and there's a lot of risk. And I think with climate change coming forward, we need to really in engage with every individual in the catchment to start to reduce that risk. So I'd say at the community at flood risk, it's, a, it's crucial to understand roughly what volume spills into the floodplain for a given return period event. So say for a one in 75 year event, you can understand what water needs to be held back up in the catchment to attenuate to capture that flood peak at minimum because you're never going to get the whole flood peak but you can it's a starting point it's a guide to where you need to go and keeping the evidence proportionate is fundamental because it's easy to get lost in desktop studies modeling exercises all the rest of it and demonstrating that water being held up in the landscape is is fundamental too so taking people to these locations and, and showing them what's been done, how it's been done, who's been involved in the process. And so boots on the ground will deliver NFM, not a hydraulic model. Thank you very much.